So often these days we see videos and hear stories of incredible polished looking climbing ascents. But what about all those times when things actually go wrong? Like really wrong. My guest today and I have memories and footage of climbs that haven't gone to plan and left us both in serious situations. In this video we focus not on the successes of climbing but on the failures. I imagine the Peak District Gritstone holds many hidden stories of fear, groundfalls and success. The stories and the climbers are what build the history and reputation of an area over many years. Niall Grimes is a character in climbing who has seen and heard it all. He co-wrote Jerry Moffat's autobiography, had regular features in iconic magazines such as Rock and Ice, and is also one of the original climbing podcasters with a great sense of humour. I don't feel like there are many people that can recall a time of nearly decking out on the Olympic gold medalist, and also a scenario that leaves you close to falling whilst free soloing. Well, Niall can. I headed out for the day with Niall to listen to his favourite untold stories. Tower chimney, tower cracking, and there was little one As the gritstone dried out, Niall started reminiscing about the time he nearly decked out of double Olympic gold medalist Dame Kelly Holmes. I couldn't miss the opportunity for Niall to share his story with us. I was watching TV one night around the time of the Olympics a few years ago. Uh, there was an interview and Dame Kelly Holmes was on talking about her success in Athens in 2004 in the 800 and 1500 metres. And at the end of the interview she said, and Dame Kelly's looking to take some other sports up. If you've any suggestions, get in touch. And I was in the BMC and I said, well, you get Dame Kelly Holmes to go climbing. And so he wrote off to Dame Kelly Holmes' management, said, fancy climbing? And they said, yeah. So strangely then we showed up over there at the plantation one time, me, a couple of other people, and Dame Kelly. She tried some slabs and then we came over here to the not to be taken away area. And I thought that the real joy in climbing is to be up big open face, seconding a big face and just thinking, wow, this is amazing. And it was a cold, kind of icy morning. And the one thing crossed my mind that'd be really cool would be this climb here, Ferry Steps. Ferry Steps is really, really easy climbing, but it's very exposed. You think, that'd be just, what a journey that'll be. Also at this point, ITV showed up and they wanted to record an interview with her. And if you've noticed, TV comes and takes over. So TV took over. And meanwhile, Dan Kelly Holmes was to Bailey and me, and I set off up uh, ferry steps of the rope. Really easy climbing, done it so many times. Not this morning. I got up there and the rock was damp on a very microscopic level. And I think there's bits of ice in there. And in this terrain that I thought was more or less walking, I kind of found myself fighting for my life. I was pressed in against the rock so close, my foot on a ledge. And I was literally just scraping down the grit to try and get my fingernails to catch on anything, anything that I could use to get my body up. And I was there waiting and I was trying and trying. And I was literally fighting for my life up there. And at one point I looked down and directly beneath me was Dame Kelly Holmes and the camera crew. I thought, I'm going to fall off here and land in Dame Kelly Holmes more worried about myself than for her, but with some concern for her, and I just clawed. When I tell the story now, sometimes you exaggerate, but as I tell that story, I can feel my body, I can feel the memory of my body of fighting for my life on the claws, claws of particles of gritstone on that really cold, icy morning. The last time I was clawing at gritstone was actually very recently when I found myself trying to on-site escape off a new E8 and really making a total mess of it. I'd just made an ascent of the zone, a climb which gets a grade of E9 at Kerber Edge, and I'd wanted to climb a direct start to that route up the lower arete. The zone had felt easy, in control and smooth. In a way, I rushed getting on the lead of the new route. Having climbed many bold headpoints, I've learned that this is one of the biggest mistakes you can make. Never rush a headpoint especially if it has a little bit of spice to it, which this one did. <sighs> In 
It's protected by skyhooks, which is a type of climbing gear that isn't really rated for falling onto. That being said, personally, I think that collectively the skyhooks would take a small fall, as they are equalised out, so the actual rating is around 3 to 4 kilonewtons, which is a holding power of 3 to 400 kilograms. Before I set off, I planned with my B layer that if I was to take a fall, she'd give me a very dynamic B lay, like they do in the international competitions and lower me within the fall so I landed onto the ground gently and in one motion without actually putting too much static force through the hooks themselves. I place the hooks at mid height and use a thin rope to tie down the hooks so that they have less chance of swinging off the placements if I was to take a sideways fall from the arete. A lot of people are probably wondering why there isn't just a bolt in this climb, and the reason is that this is gritstone, and this is a rock type that has a long ethic and tradition of using no bolts. When this sort of tradition evolves over many years, it's important to respect it. Many people say climbing is great because there are no rules, like in other sports, and in general there aren't, but the ethics are the unwritten rules for each particular area and climbing location. They are there for a reason, often to preserve the area, and also to respect the history and climbers who have come before you to develop the climbs which you can enjoy. I believe these ethics yeah. should be followed, and if the unwritten rules of a specific area don't match how you would like to climb, then it's best to find an area that does match up, and you'll have a much better time. All areas, and sometimes rock types within these areas, have specific ethics, so it's easy to find something that fits your need as a climber. By this point, my fingers had gone a little numb from the cold, so the sensible thing in this position would have been to lower off. Climbing the hard top section with wooden-like fingers is a terrible idea. I thought that the climbing was easy enough and a long way within my ability that I could pull it off anyway, and in a moment of complete madness, I set off with cold hands. Immediately, I could feel the lack of sensitivity in my fingers was a problem, but instead of doing the right thing and making my way back to the hooks, I ploughed on. I climbed into an irreversible position. Now I was in survival mode to ensure I didn't fall on the sky hooks below. My only option was to make an on-site retreat into the neighbouring route. I immediately found myself <laughs> grappling with slopers to reach the security of the crack. It was one of the first times I've ever made a bail of this type off a climb, and it was a sharp reminder to always listen to my experience and don't go against my gut instinct. Yeah, I didn't have it properly. Yeah, a little bit cold. I'm glad I didn't fall onto those hooks, and I'm also glad Niall didn't wipe out Dame Kelly Holmes. I climbed the new route a couple of days later, and was left wondering about the grade, especially as I was able to escape from it on site. After thinking about it, in my opinion, both this climb and the zone felt like E8. The original grade of the zone got E9, and how the first ascent was done probably was this grade. However, with the tactics that I, and other people use today, such as modern padding and tied down sky hooks, along with finding out that the route is totally escapable from the crux move, it didn't feel that great to me. I think E8 for both routes seems fair. It was this time we used to come to Stanage, and the thing was the solo, you just solo, 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 solo. You become really tuned in to soloing and felt really secure and really safe. You'd mess around and me and this guy peek it and he's soloing with one hand, just using one hand to solo. And it's really cool, the rule was you had to put one hand in your pocket and then solo the climb. A few years ago I came here one evening, I did the tippler there and E1, a second the tippler, I thought that oh, was good fun. And there's another couple in the tippler, some man led it and then his girlfriend or whatever was coming up behind him. And the way then I looked up and saw uh, this thing here, Townsend's variation. And I recalled the soloing days, and I used to do that with one hand in my pocket. Just there was no difficulty in it at all, it was just so easy. And I thought I'll just solo it again for old time's sake. And I set out across the face, and it was kind of strangely just getting harder and harder. And the footholds felt a bit scriggly. And I got to the stage of really forcing myself on. I was really pushing hard to make each move, and there's nobody else around. And I forced out one move, and this isn't how I remembered it. Forced out another move. This is kind of going a bit west is and I get higher and I got to this point where I thought it's in the crux kind of relieved and then realized oh no this is the crux and I kind of couldn't believe I used to solo this one-handed but at two hands nothing felt secure and I was putting my foot up in this foothold to stand up and it was really slopey 
and there was gritstone underneath it and I could feel the gritstone scraping around underneath my foot. It was getting scarier and scarier and I pushed out one more move and by this point my heart rate had really gone up. It was kind of... And I, I still hadn't done the move, still had the hard move to go and I glanced over and at the top of the tippler that leader was bringing up his girlfriend and he kept looking over at me just glancing over and I became aware that he's realizing how on edge I am and he could hear my breathing and hear my scraping and just picked up on my energy and all I could think of he kept looking at me I had to do this move and I kept imagining he's thinking I'm out here for a nice night of leading with my girlfriend and look at that bastard he's going to fall off and ruin the entire evening